Police say those words ended the biggest manhunt in New York City history with the capture of Son of Sam. After more than 13 months of following thousands of leads down endless blind alleys, David Berkowitz, 24 years old, a postal worker, walked out of his Yonkers apartment last night, turned the ignition key in his car, and found himself surrounded by police. The detectives of the Brooklyn Omega Squad, part of that 300 cop 44 killer manhunt, captured the man they say is son of Sam. The attacks ended when police tracked the 24-year-old postal clerk to his apartment in Yonkers because he got a parking ticket near the scene of his last murder. Police transported David Berkowitz from headquarters to Brooklyn Central Booking after my sources say he confessed to being the 44 killer. In general, his neighbors describe him as basically nice, quiet, kept to himself, perhaps a little strange, perhaps a little moody. You just turned 64. Yeah, I just turned 64, yeah. What would you tell 23-year-old David Berkowitz today? Turn around before it's too late because destruction is coming, you know. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, that, that was not me. That was not me. This, this, even the... that. Name, I, I hate that name, I despise that name. That, Which name? That moniker, Son of Sam. That was a demon. In the sweltering summer of 1977, fear gripped the streets of New York City as a shadowy figure stalked the night, leaving behind a trail of terror and bloodshed. The city that never sleeps was plunged into a state of panic as news of the Son of Sam spread like wildfire, haunting the collective consciousness of its inhabitants. David Berkowitz, the man behind the infamous moniker Son of Sam, struck fear into the hearts of millions with his ruthless killing spree, forever etching his name into the annals of true crime history. But who was the Son of Sam, and what drove him to commit such heinous acts? The child who would become the son of Sam was born Richard David Falco on June 1, 1953, in Brooklyn, New York. His biological mother Elizabeth Betty Broder, had been previously married to an Italian-American man named Tony Falco in 1936, and had a daughter Rosone with him, however after a mere four years of their lives, Falco abandoned her for another woman, yet they never divorced according to some reports. Broder later got into a relationship with the already married man Joseph Kleinman. When Kleinman found out that Broder was pregnant with him, he forced Broder to give the baby up for adoption, while some reports claimed that she was even pressured for an abortion, to which Broder didn't agree and they separated shortly before the child was born. Broder gave birth to the baby in 1953 and listed her ex-husband Falco as his father, thus giving him the name Richard David Falco. Just a couple of days after birth, Richard was adopted by a childless middle-aged couple named Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz of the Bronx, who were hardware store retailers. The Jewish couple reversed the order of the baby's initials and the middle name, altering the name to David Richard Berkowitz. Pearl was extremely close to the kid as he was the only child she had, meanwhile Nathan reportedly considered the adoption a mistake and wasn't very attached to the child. The bulky David was described as hyperactive and mischievous since early childhood and was an avid baseball player. From a young age, David began to show early signs of his future violent behavior patterns. While he was of above-average intelligence, he lost interest in school studies and instead focused on more rebellious habits, getting involved in petty larceny and pyromania. According to the book Confessions of the Son of Sam, which features interviews with Berkowitz, he was reportedly told as a child that his biological mother had died during childbirth, which burdened the kid's heart with an overwhelming sense of guilt from a young age. This tragic revelation fueled feelings of confusion and inadequacy, leading David to exhibit erratic behavior and bully others. His adoptive parents, grappling with his troubling conduct, eventually sought the help of a psychotherapist in hopes of addressing his escalating issues, however David's inner turmoil would ultimately manifest in unimaginable ways, culminating in a reign of terror that would forever alter the course of history. When David was seven, he got hit by a car and suffered from severe head injuries, although it's unclear whether this injury had any long-term effect on David or not, however he was reportedly involved in several head injuries during his childhood. In his pastime activities, David displayed a peculiar fascination with fires, 
progressing from burning bugs to igniting fires in his neighborhood. 14-year-old David's life turned upside down in 1967 when the only person he had a close relationship with, his adoptive mother, died of breast cancer after a two-year battle. Afterward, David's relationship with his adoptive father worsened and he became utterly introverted with no close family or friend relations. After graduating from high school in 1971, David attended Christopher Columbus High School while living with his father, however his life took another harsh turn when he became utterly depressed following his adoptive father Nathan's remarriage in 1971. Subsequently the newly married couple moved to Florida without their teenage child. Seeking solace from his solitude, he enlisted in the U.S. Army at the tender age of 17, finding purpose and belonging at Fort Knox in 1971. His time in the military proved transformative, as he displayed impressive acumen and remarkable skills as a marksman, honing abilities that would later prove invaluable on the streets of New York. Despite the discipline and structure provided by Army life, David's past haunted him. After some basic training in the U.S., he was sent to Korea and then was given an honorable discharge after three years in June 1974. Just after he left the Army, he discovered his biological mother's existence, and this revelation which had been hidden from him for years, deepened his inner turmoil. His attempts to successfully reconnect with his birth family ended in disappointment, after he discovered that his mother had placed him for adoption under pressure from his birth father, leaving him grappling with a shattered sense of identity and an overwhelming sense of being unwanted, as if his very existence was a mistake. He later claimed in interviews that the revelation of this deception, coupled with feelings of abandonment by both his birth and adoptive fathers, fueled a sense of rage and betrayal within him. Through his tumultuous journey, David felt the weight of loss and guilt, yearning for a sense of belonging that remained elusive. Forensic anthropologist Elliot Layton described Berkowitz's discovery of his birth details as the primary crisis of his life, a revelation that shattered his sense of identity. Suffice it to say that this didn't foreshadow positive developments for the remainder of his life and set the stage for the challenge that lay ahead. Living on his own, David rented an apartment in the Bronx, using the money that he had saved during his time in the Army, while also attending classes at Bronx Community College for one year in 1975. During this period, he was recalled as a young man filled with anger and contentiousness, actively avoiding social interaction. Meanwhile, David took on many non-professional jobs, including mail sorter, security guard, and cab driver. David's actions quickly brought him under the scrutiny of both his neighbors and the local police department, after his penchant for initiating disputes and aggravating them with personal threats did not go unnoticed. Notably, Deputy Police Sheriff Charles Glassman, residing on the floor below, found himself the recipient of four handwritten threats from David. Living in the apartment and feeling isolated from the world around him, David had regained his fascination with fires, and over the course of the next three years starting in 1974, he allegedly set around 1,500 fires in New York City alone, according to his own journal in which he referred to himself as the Phantom of the Bronx. Around this time in 1975, David's mental health began to deteriorate, and he started hearing strange voices, particularly those of women whom he claimed to be his enemies. In 1975, David found himself drawn to a new fascination, this time delving into the occult. His interest was sparked after reading the Satanic Bible by Anton Levy, the founder of the Church of Satan. Intrigued by its teachings, David became convinced that he was under the influence of evil spirits. In late November 1975, David wrote a letter to his father, and in it, he said, it's cold and gloomy here in New York, but that's okay because the weather fits my mood. Dad the world is getting dark now. According to his own accounts, David's killing career began on Christmas Eve, December 24, 1975, just a month after sending the letter to his father. Armed with a hunting knife, he targeted two women in Co-op City. The first victim, a Hispanic woman, was leaving the grocery store when David stabbed her numerous times before she managed to escape, unfortunately the woman remained unidentified by the police forever. 
His second victim was identified as 15-year-old Michelle Foreman, a sophomore at Truman High School. Berkowitz stabbed her six times on a bridge near Dreiser Loop before she found temporary refuge by running to a nearby apartment. However, the severity of the stabbing inflicted serious injuries that required her hospitalization for a week. And despite the severity of the attack, David initially evaded suspicion for these crimes. In late January 1976, David moved from the Bronx to a rented house in Yonkers. His landlords happened to own a black Labrador dog whose peculiar barking struck him as nothing short of eerie. Later on, David would claim that this very dog was under the influence of Satan, its barking acting as sinister commands urging him to commit unspeakable acts and murders. During this time, he was employed as a night shift security guard, however the incessant barking of the dog once pushed him to the brink of despair, leading him to contemplate taking his own life. After enduring three months of this torment, David decided to relocate to an apartment on 35 Pine Street in Yonkers, but fate seemed to conspire against him as he found himself unable to escape the relentless barking, interpreting it as a malevolent sign from Satan himself. In a desperate attempt to silence the perceived source of his torment, he once resorted to using a Molotov cocktail in an effort to eliminate the dog owned by his neighbor, a man named Sam Carr. David became convinced that Sam's dog, which he believed to be controlled by demonic forces, was commanding him to commit murder. After unsuccessfully attempting to silence the dog with a Molotov, Berkowitz resorted to shooting it. According to David's accounts, this act, coupled with his belief that Sam was a conduit for evil, led David to adopt the infamous moniker Son of Sam as he embarked on a series of brutal attacks. Concurrently, David transitioned from his role as a security guard to driving for the Co-op City Taxi Company, albeit briefly, as this stint lasted only a month and by the end of July, he had shifted to a day job as an installer of air conditioning ducts, marking yet another transition in his tumultuous journey. Following his failed attempts with knives, David opted for more effective means to carry out his crimes. Procuring a .44 caliber revolver, he swiftly expanded his arsenal to include a Commando Mark III rifle, a Glenfield rifle equipped with a telescopic sight, a Charter Arms AR-7, and a 12-gauge Ithaca Deerslayer shotgun by June of 1976. David often chose his victims who were in pairs, and that's what happened at about 1.10 a.m. on July 29, 1976, when two teenage girls were seated in double-parked Oldsmobile, discussing their evening at Peachtree's, a new Rochelle discotheque in the Pelham Bay neighborhood of the Bronx. As Donna Loria, an emergency medical technician, prepared to exit the car, she noticed a man rapidly approaching. The man then brandished a gun from a paper bag he carried, assuming a crouched position. With one elbow braced on his knee, he aimed his weapon with both hands and fired, fatally striking 18-year-old Loria with a single bullet. Her 19-year-old friend Jody Valenti, reacted violently by screaming and desperately honking the car horn, sustaining a gunshot wound to her thigh, while a third bullet narrowly missed both women, and the man vanished into the darkness of the night. Valenti surviving her injury, could not precisely identify the killer, and later vaguely described him as a white male in his 30s, around 5 feet 8 inches tall, and weighing approximately 200 pounds. She noted his short dark curly hair styled in a mod fashion. This description was echoed by Loria's father, who claimed to have seen a similar individual seated in a nearby yellow compact car. Suspicion heightened as neighbors reported sightings of an unfamiliar yellow compact car cruising the area in the hours leading up to the shooting. At the time, police hardly investigated the shootings in detail, and closed the case as there seemed to be no tangible motive for the shootings. Years later in 1993, Berkowitz confessed to journalist Maury Terry that he was responsible for the shootings of Loria and Valenti. On October 23, 1976, three months later after his first murder, and once again targeting the pair, another shooting occurred by David while driving down a street, mirroring the pattern of the previous attacks. Carl DeNaro, a 20-year-old Citibank security guard, and his date, Rosemary Keenan, 
an 18-year-old Queens College student who happened to be the daughter of a veteran police detective with the New York City Police Department, were together sitting in Keenan's parked car during the dead of night in a secluded area of Flushing, Queens near Bound Park, when the windows suddenly shattered. Denaro later described the sensation as feeling like the car had exploded. Despite being injured by a bullet to the head, Denaro and Keenan initially did not realize they had been shot at and thought the broken glass caused Denaro's bleeding. Keenan's father prompted an intense investigation into the incident, and as a result, the bullets recovered from Keenan's car were identified as .44 caliber, however their deformation made it difficult for police to link them to a specific weapon, and despite the similarities between this shooting and the Lori Valenti case, including the lack of an apparent motive and the .44 caliber bullets. Police did not initially connect the two incidents due to jurisdictional differences and separate investigations by different precincts. Police later speculated that the shooter mistook Denaro for a woman due to his shoulder-length hair, since David mainly targeted women aged between 15 and 20, all with pretty similar facial characteristics, good-looking in long brown hair, which led to a trend of women in New York eventually dyeing their hair blonde and cutting it short, in efforts to remain safe from the killer that was terrorizing the streets. Apparently David's adoptive mother, who had lied to him about his biological mother's existence, looked like a lot of his victims. A month later on November 27, 1976, high school students Donna DeMaisi aged 16, and Joanne Lomino aged 18 were walking home after a late-night movie. Unbeknownst to them, David followed them all the way, and upon reaching Lomino's home in Floral Park, they were conversing on the porch when a young man dressed in military fatigues approached them under the guise of asking for directions. Suddenly, he produced a revolver and shot bullets that tore through the bodies of each of the victims once. As DeMazi and Lomino fell to the ground injured, he fired several more shots, hitting the house before melting from the scene. A neighbor heard the gunshots, rushed out, and reported witnessing a blonde man running past holding a pistol in his left hand. DeMaisi sustained a non-life-threatening gunshot wound to the neck while Lomino was struck in the back and hospitalized in serious condition, ultimately getting paralyzed from the waist down. The next year brought even more shootings, and the attacks reoccurred on a pair again with a similar modus operandi at around 12.40 a.m. on January 30, 1977, when an engaged couple, 26-year-old secretary Christine Freund and her bartender fiancé, 30-year-old John Deal, were sitting in Deal's car near the Forest Hills Long Island Rail Road Station in Queens, when they realized the car had been shot at. Suddenly two more gunshots pierced the car, and in a state of panic, Deal hastily drove away, seeking help. Deal suffered minor injuries, while Freund tragically succumbed to her injuries several hours later at the hospital after getting shot twice. Remarkably, neither victim had caught sight of their assailant. In a significant development, law enforcement publicly linked this case to the previous shootings, highlighting the commonalities as all incidents involved a .44 caliber firearm, and the assailant appeared to focus on young women with long dark hair. Following this attack, David targeted a 20-year-old Bulgarian immigrant by the name of Virginia Voskarikian, who was walking home from Columbia University when a man approached her face-to-face -face with a gun in hand at about 7.30 p.m. on March 8, 1977. In a courageous attempt to defend herself, she raised her textbooks as a makeshift shield against her attacker, unsurprisingly the bullet pierced through the books and struck her head, resulting in her untimely death. Later during a press conference held on March 10, 1977, NYPD officials and Mayor Abraham Beam announced that they believed the same .44 Bulldog revolvers had been utilized in the fatal shootings of both Donna Loria and Virginia Voskarikian. However subsequent revelations from official documents revealed a lack of conclusive evidence to definitively link the firearm to both incidents. The crimes escalated to the point where the NYPD initiated Operation Omega in response to a series of murders committed in a short period possibly by the same man. It was the department's most extensive investigation in its history, led by Deputy Inspector Timothy Dowd, over 300 detectives were deployed for the operation, 
costing approximately $90,000 daily. Additionally around 45 psychiatrists analyzed the taunting letters that were about to be written by Berkowitz. On April 17, 1977, 20-year-old Alexander Esau and 18-year-old Valentina Suriani were shot around 3 a.m. while seated in a car belonging to Esau's brother on the Hutchinson River Parkway service road in the Bronx. Suriani tragically succumbed to her injuries at the scene, while Esau passed away in the hospital several hours after the incident. Upon visiting the site a while after the incident, the police captain, Joseph Borelli, found a letter addressed to the police that had been left by the killer himself. Captain Joseph Borelli of NYPD played a leading role as one of the key members of the Omega operation. The letter addressed to the captain mainly conveyed the killer's resolve to persist in his crimes and mocked the police for their unsuccessful attempts to apprehend him. The letter read in part, Dear Captain Joseph Borelli, I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater, I am not, but I am a monster, I am the son of Sam, I am a little brat, Sam loves to drink blood, I feel like an outsider, I am on a different wavelength than everybody else, programmed to kill, however to stop me, you must kill me. Attention all police, shoot me first, shoot to kill, or else keep out of my way, or you will die, I am the monster, Beelzebub, the chubby behemoth, I love to hunt, prowling the streets looking for fair game and tasty meat. The women of Queens are the prettiest of all, it must be the water they drink, I live for the hunt, my life, blood for papa, I want to make love to the world, I love people, I don't belong on earth, return me to Yahoo. This marked the first instance when the notorious moniker Son of Sam entered the public lexicon as the killer identified himself as Son of Sam in a letter. Prior to this revelation, the press had consistently referred to the perpetrator as the .44 caliber killer. Additionally, the letter was written so poorly and with such bad spelling that the police initially suspected the individual might be Scottish or of Scottish-American descent. After conducting consultations with several psychiatrists, the police compiled a psychological profile of their suspect, aiming to understand his motivations and mental state. The profile, released on May 26, 1977, provided valuable insights, describing him as neurotic, and suggesting that he exhibited signs of emotional instability, anxiety, and possibly obsessive behavior. Furthermore, the profile indicated that the suspect likely suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, a severe mental disorder characterized by delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized thinking. This diagnosis suggested that the suspect experienced distorted perceptions of reality, leading him to believe that he was under the influence of demonic forces. Now known as the Son of Sam by authorities, Berkowitz wrote another letter on May 30, 1977, to New York's most famous crime writer Jimmy Breslin. This time the letter stood out for its sophistication in both wording and presentation, particularly when compared to the initially crudely written letter, leading police to suspect that it was crafted by someone skilled in printing, calligraphy, or graphic design, possibly in an art studio. Its unusual style prompted speculation that the perpetrator might be a comic book letterer, prompting consultation with DC Comics staff. Oddly the letter was titled with a biblical reference, Blood and Family, Darkness and Death, Absolute Depravity, Point four four, all written in four precisely centered lines. The letter read in part, I'm just dropping you a line to let you know that I appreciate your interest in those recent and horrendous point forty four killings. I also want to tell you that I read your column daily, and I find it quite informative. Tell me Jim, what will you have for July 29th? You can forget about me if you like, because I don't care for publicity, however you must not forget Donna Loria, and you cannot let the people forget her either. She was a very very sweet girl, but Sam's a thirsty lad, and he won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. Perhaps we will meet face to face someday, or perhaps I will be blown away by cops for smoking point thirty eights. Whatever, if I am fortunate enough to meet you, I will tell you all about Sam if you like, and I will introduce you to him. His name is Sam the Terrible. Upon my capture, I promise to buy all the guys working the case a new pair of shoes if I can get the money. In the letter, 
what will you have for July 29th, was considered a threat by the killer, and July 29th was also the anniversary of the Loria Valenti shootings. The Daily News published this Son of Sam's letter a week later, after agreeing with the police to withhold some of its contents as a part of journalist Jimmy Breslin's article in which he urged the killer to surrender. This dramatic article led to record-breaking sales of over 1.1 million copies, while despite the publicity, thousands of tips based on the published parts of the letter failed to assist the police in apprehending the perpetrator. The police had barely enough time to conclude their previous investigations before the perpetrator struck again on June 26, 1977, targeting another pair of individuals sitting in a parked car at around 3 a.m. According to victims' accounts, they had been discussing the Son of Sam case just moments before the incident, as the notorious Son of Sam had been gaining media attention recently. Salvatore Lupo, a 20-year-old mechanics helper, suffered a wound to his right forearm, while 17-year-old recent high school graduate Judy Placido was shot in the right temple, shoulder, and back of the neck, fortunately both victims survived the attack. As July approached, the police intensified their efforts by establishing a substantial dragnet focused on past hunting grounds in Queens and the Bronx. Unexpectedly on July 31st, Berkowitz once again reappeared on the streets of New York, hunting for a pair of young people in a parked car. 20-year-old Secretary Stacy Moskowitz and 20-year-old clothing salesman Robert Violanti were on their first ever date and were kissing at the time, when a man approached within three feet of the passenger window, firing a total of four rounds at their heads. Stacy Moskowitz, the only blonde and the last victim of Berkowitz, died of wounds two days later, while Violanti lost his left eye and about 90% of his vision. We decided to drive to one of the, uh, as they call it, a lover's lane. But we got out, and uh, we went into the park. When I walked to the swings, I saw who I found out later on was Berkowitz. But then I didn't pay no mind, just figured he's just some guy hanging out in the park, you know. So we go onto the swings, but now Stacy turns to me and says, Robert, you know what? I'm getting a little nervous. Why don't we go back to the car? I went back into the car. Now we're sitting there a couple of minutes and we're just talking, you know, kissing a little bit and talking and, uh, and that was it. And then five minutes later is when everything happened, when I got shot. I woke up and I couldn't see anything. I was totally blind. I was totally, you know, full of blood. I couldn't see Stacy sitting right next to me. The bullet totally destroyed the left eye and most of my right eye. On the night of the Moskowitz Violanti shooting, a woman named Cassilia Davis was walking her dog when she encountered a young man who stared at her menacingly. Feeling frightened, she noticed him following her and possibly holding something dark in his hand. As she began to run towards her house, the man fired shots in her direction. For days later, Davis reported the incident to the police, recounting how she had seen an officer ticketing the same young man just moments before he fired at her. This revelation led the police to question every driver who had been ticketed that night in the city, and one among them was David Berkowitz, the owner of a Ford Galaxy. Men come towards me, and he looked me straight in the face, he looked at my dog, and right here, we, we crossed each other. So he had his arms straight down, he had a long thing, like a bell sticking up his sleeve. I don't know, he looked nice. On August 9, 1977, Detective James Justice of the NYPD attempted to reach Berkowitz by phone, but received no response and then contacted the Yonkers Police Department for assistance. Coincidentally, the dispatcher he spoke to happened to be Wheat Carr, the daughter of Sam Carr, Berkowitz's former landlord, and the individual whose name inspired the son of Sam that Berkowitz had adopted for himself. Just hearing David Berkowitz, Wheat immediately responded by saying, let me tell you about him. I know him. He lives right behind me. Afterward, police interviewed Sam Carr, 
who informed them that David had shot his dog in an attempt to stop its barking. This led to the police gathering more evidence that pointed to Berkowitz as a possible criminal. On August 10, police conducted an investigation of Berkowitz's car parked outside his apartment building at 35 Pine Street, Yonkers. Inside the vehicle's back seat, authorities found a .44 caliber bulldog revolver, along with a duffel bag containing ammunition, maps marking the crime scenes, and a threatening letter addressed to Inspector Timothy Dowd of the Son of Sam Task Force that warned of a coming attack on a disco. Lacking a search warrant, the police opted to wait outside near his car for his appearance, while one of the officers was dispatched to obtain the search warrant, the remaining officers stayed near the car. A civilian was instructed to park his vehicle strategically, effectively blocking Berkowitz's car and making it difficult for him to flee in case he attempted to leave the apartment before the search warrant was secured. Eventually, Berkowitz emerged from his apartment and entered his car at around 10 p.m. Detective John Falotico swiftly approached the driver's side and tapped on his window. Berkowitz, with a smile on his face, gently rolled down the window, and Falotico aimed his gun at David's temple, while Detective Sergeant William Gardella aimed from the passenger side. To the surprise of the officers, Berkowitz calmly stated, Well, you got me, how come it took you such a long time? Detective Falotico recalled the inexplicable smile on the man's face as they engaged in small talk and when asked for his identity, the man calmly replied, I am Sam, David Berkowitz. Detective John Falotico was officially credited by the NYPD as the arresting officer of the son of Sam. Upon searching Berkowitz's apartment just after his arrest, police found a state of complete misery, satanic graffiti adorning the walls, along with uncovering some diaries dating back to when David was 21, and three stenographers' notebooks nearly filled, in which Berkowitz had carefully detailed hundreds of arsons he claimed to have set throughout New York City. Following his arrest, he was initially placed in a psychiatric ward at Kings County Hospital, where staff noted his significant distress over his surroundings. Soon after, authorities changed the address of the apartment building where he resided from 35 Pine Street to 42 Pine Street, hoping to diminish its connection to the infamous criminal. Berkowitz was then briefly detained at a Yonkers police station before being promptly transported to the 60th Precinct located in Coney Island, the headquarters of the Son of Sam Task Force. Mayor Beam arrived around 1 a.m. to personally witness the suspect and announced to the media, the people of the city of New York can rest easy because of the fact that the police have captured a man whom they believe to be the Son of Sam. On August 11, 1977, Berkowitz, who appeared to be interested in pleading guilty, was interviewed for about half an hour, during which he confessed to all the crimes that police had linked him to. Furthermore, David claimed that the Sam referenced in the initial letter was his former neighbor, Sam Carr. According to David, Carr's black Labrador retriever, Harvey, was possessed by an ancient demon that compelled David to commit murders. He elaborated that the demon, residing within the dog, issued irresistible commands for him to kill people, and asserted that the dog specifically demanded the blood of pretty young girls, which motivated his heinous acts against his victims. In a letter to the New York Post dated September 19, 1977, David Berkowitz referenced his previous claim of being influenced by demonic possession, however he concluded the letter with a cryptic warning that has led some investigators to speculate about the possibility of accomplices in his crimes. The phrase, there are other sons out there, God help the world, is highly interpreted as an admission or indication that David may not have acted alone in his attacks. Possibly trying to shift some part of his personality, during the press conference in February 1979, Berkowitz completely denied any claims of demonic possession, and asserted that he had not been ordered by a dog to commit the crimes. He admitted that his previous statements regarding being influenced by a dog were entirely fabricated and amounted to nothing more than a hoax. During his meetings with the court-appointed psychiatrist, David Abrahamson, Berkowitz revealed that he had harbored thoughts of murder as a means of seeking revenge against a world he perceived as having rejected and harmed him. In an attempt to spare David from facing execution, 
his defense lawyers recommended that he plead not guilty by reason of insanity, however Berkowitz himself refused to accept this plea, and later said, I just wanted to end it, and I was so distraught. I just confessed and pleaded guilty, got it over with, and just wanted to get out of that environment. On May 8, 1978, Berkowitz appeared in court extremely calmly and pleaded guilty to all of the shootings. During his sentencing, he attempted to jump from the seventh floor courtroom but failed and then proceeded to shout, Stacy was a whore, I'd kill her again, I'd kill them all again. In one incident during his sentencing, Berkowitz created a drawing depicting a man imprisoned within multiple walls, with a caption at the bottom stating, I am not well, not well at all. Berkowitz once described his life while serving sentencing at the Attica Correctional Facility as a nightmare. On June 12, 1978, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for each murder and for each to be served consecutively. In 1987, while serving time in prison, David Berkowitz underwent a remarkable transformation, becoming a born-again Christian. His conversion, according to him, was sparked by a profound experience while reading something from a Bible given to him by a fellow inmate. This pivotal moment catalyzed a profound shift in Berkowitz's worldview, prompting him to abandon his infamous moniker as the Son of Sam and embrace a new identity as the Son of Hope. He wrote essays about hope and redemption on Christian websites and even counseled prisoners who had their own troubles. Well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is David and I'd like to greet you in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, giving you this message with the hope that it will encourage you and inspire you and give you some hope inside your heart. And it so happens that right here, I'm speaking to you from inside of a prison in the United States of America. I've been in prison for 35 years, locked up. And uh, I came to prison when I was 24 years old after committing some very terrible crimes, I took innocent lives, I lived a very bad life, and I'm sorry for that. But over the course of time, the Lord touched my heart, and He's given me a new life. And that's why I'm reaching out to you with the hopes that maybe something I can share would touch your heart and inspire your heart. So this is really a message of hope, and uh, I'd like to read this uh, that I prepared for uh, the students at the youth home and wherever else, whoever else might be watching, watching this film or listening to this further down the road. While in the Sullivan facility, he passionately pursued education and graduated with honors from Sullivan Community College. In 1979, Berkowitz experienced an assassination attempt from an inmate, sustaining a deep slash wound on the left side of his neck that necessitated over 50 stitches for closure. Despite the severity of the attack, Berkowitz chose to remain silent regarding the identity of his assailant. Surprisingly instead of expressing anger or seeking retribution, he displayed a sense of gratitude for the assault. In his own words, Berkowitz described the incident as bringing him a feeling of justice, or, the punishment I deserve. During his imprisonment, Berkowitz sought the help of an exorcist, Malachi Martin, to collaborate on an autobiography, likely aiming to explore the spiritual aspects of his crimes and his conversion to Christianity, however Martin declined the offer for the reasons unspecified. David Berkowitz, the infamous son of Sam, has been eligible for parole every two years since 2002, but he has consistently declined the opportunity to seek release, sometimes skipping hearings altogether. In 2002, before his first parole hearing, he wrote to Governor George Pataki, requesting its cancellation, expressing his belief in deserving lifelong imprisonment. He wrote, in all honesty, I believe that I deserve to be in prison for the rest of my life. I have, with God's help, long ago come to terms with my situation, and I have accepted my punishment. Despite his plea, officials denied his request, emphasizing Berkowitz's acceptance of his sentence and commitment to remaining incarcerated. 
During his 2016 parole hearing in Shangum, New York, Berkowitz reflected on his time in prison, acknowledging that while parole seemed unlikely, he believed he had undergone personal growth and rehabilitation. Expressing confidence that he posed no risk to society, Berkowitz emphasized his efforts towards self-improvement. His lawyer, Mark Heller, supported his plea for parole, citing prison staff's assessment of Berkowitz as a model prisoner. Despite Berkowitz's positive outlook and Heller's advocacy, the parole commissioners ultimately denied his request for parole, and now his next parole hearing is scheduled for May 2024. Hugo Harmatz, a New Jersey lawyer, found himself caught up in a legal dispute involving David Berkowitz. Initially representing Berkowitz to prevent the National Enquirer from acquiring one of his letters, Harmatz later compiled his letters and memorabilia obtained during their consultations into a self-published book titled, Dear David, in 2005. Berkowitz demanded that Harmatz hand over all profits from the book to his victims' families. After months of legal battles, Berkowitz and Harmatz reached an out-of-court settlement in October 2006. As part of the agreement, Harmatz agreed to return disputed items to Berkowitz and pledged to donate a portion of the book profits to the New York State Crime Victims Board. After entering Sullivan Prison, Berkowitz began asserting his involvement with a satanic cult, dating back to the spring of 1975. In 1993, Berkowitz publicly disclosed this claim, stating that he was accountable for only three of the Son of Sam murders, those of Loria, Esau, and Suriani. He contended that additional individuals were also implicated as shooters, with him personally firing the gun in only the first and sixth attacks. According to his revised narrative, Berkowitz and multiple cult members orchestrated the attacks, conducting surveillance of the victims beforehand and assuming various roles during the crimes. Despite his assertions, Berkowitz maintained his silence on the identities of most accomplices, citing concerns for his family's safety. He alleged the involvement of unnamed cult members in various shootings, including a female who fired the gun at Denaro and Keenan, and a male from North Dakota in the moskowitz violante case. He named John and Michael Carr, sons of Sam Carr, as cult members, with both deceased at the time of Berkowitz's claims. John Carr's death was deemed a suicide in 1978, while Michael Carr died in a car accident in 1979. Berkowitz attributed specific shootings to each brother, and implicated a Yonkers police officer as a cult member involved in a crime. Additionally, he mentioned Michael's affiliation with the Church of Scientology and his own influence on the literature of the Process Church of the Final Judgment. Like Berkowitz's claims, many people believed that he was not alone but had accomplices. Among those who shared his belief was journalist John Hockenberry, who stated that beyond the satanic cult claims, numerous officials questioned the single-shooter theory, highlighting, what most don't know about the Son of Sam case is that from the beginning, not everyone bought the idea that Berkowitz acted alone. In 1979, journalist Maury Terry questioned the lone gunman theory in the Son of Sam case, sparking renewed interest. Despite initial skepticism from police, Terry's work prompted a reopening of the case in 1996 by Yonkers police, although no new charges were brought. Terry's findings were later the basis for the Netflix series, The Sons of Sam, a descent into darkness. Meanwhile Berkowitz continued to claim demonic possession from prison, challenging the media's portrayal of Son of Sam as a dog. David Berkowitz, the Son of Sam, remains a notorious figure in popular culture, even decades after his arrest. Despite his past crimes, Berkowitz has expressed remorse and sought redemption through engagement with Christian websites and public denouncements of gun violence. Nasa Moskowitz, who lost her daughter Stacy to Berkowitz's actions, surprisingly forgave him in a letter before her death in 2006, despite openly expressing hatred towards him initially. In response to concerns about Berkowitz profiting from his crimes, the New York State Legislature enacted the Son of Sam law, preventing convicted criminals and their relatives from making financial gains through books, movies, or related ventures. The law faced constitutional challenges, 
but was revised in 1992 after a Supreme Court ruling. The notorious case drew inspiration from the popular crime thriller film, Summer of Sam, which primarily explores the atmosphere of fear and paranoia caused by the Son of Sam killings. Various movies and TV shows have portrayed David Berkowitz over decades, such as Son of Sam, Out of the Darkness, and The Bronx is Burning. Oliver Cooper played David Berkowitz in Mindhunter in 2019 and Netflix's documentary series The Sons of Sam, A Descent into Darkness, revisited the case in 2021. Additionally, the character of Son of Sam is referenced in episodes of Seinfeld and Only Murders in the Building, contributing to the ongoing cultural fascination with the case. In addition to films and series, several songs reference David Berkowitz indirectly, like Psycho Killer by Talking Heads and Son of Sam by Elliot Smith. Others, such as Son of Sam by The Dead Boys and Looking Down the Barrel of a Gun by The Beastie Boys, directly relate to David. Todd Rundgren and Billy Joel also mentioned him in their songs. Shinedown and rapper Lucky released tracks titled Son of Sam. Additionally, a cartoon featuring David and Toucan Sam was part of Green Gel serial killer video before copyright issues arose. The case of David Berkowitz remains one of the most infamous chapters in criminal history, from the terror he inflicted on New York City during the summer of 1977 to his later claims of involvement with a satanic cult. David's story continues to captivate public interest and inspire various forms of media including books, movies, and songs. Despite the passage of time, the wounds caused by David's actions still linger for the families of his victim, however amidst the darkness, moments of forgiveness and redemption emerge, reminding us of the complexity of human nature and the power of resilience. While David himself may never fully escape the shadow of his past, his tale serves as a cautionary reminder of the enduring impact of crime and the ongoing quest for justice and healing.